Hi, my name is Ken Kinter, and I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. And the purpose of this presentation is to talk about suicide, facts, approaches, and interventions. Now, this is a 2022 update, so this is a newer version. There's a previous version out, but this one has newer data and some newer stuff in it. So before we get started, I wanted to talk about the project that I work for. It's called the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative. And it's an affiliation between Rutgers University and the State Psychiatric Hospitals in New Jersey. So I want to give credit where credit is due. The New Jersey Department of Health helps fund us. They also give us other types of support, which helps us to hopefully improve the working conditions and the care provided by New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospitals. So without them, none of this is possible. So I've got to give them some credit. So as far as the objectives, you can read them here, but it fits into three major areas. One is statistics about suicide. Two is about working with people with suicide, some tips about that. And three is some resources and other helpful things uh, when you're working with people who will be suicidal, because if you work in the field, you've either already come across this or will be coming across it. So let's start out with some of the, the uh, data. So 45,979 suicides in the United States through 2020. Uh, that is a decrease from 2019. And that's uh, pretty much a new thing. It's been the suicide rate has been increasing from 1999 to 2018. There are some reasons why that number may be an anomaly. We're going to talk a bit about COVID and the influence of fentanyl and things like that on the suicide rate. So uh, what's happened is that suicide at one point prior to COVID was the ninth leading cause of death in the United States, and it's since dropped down to 12. Uh, and actually, New Jersey is pretty much on the low end of that. We're one of the lowest states. There are a few states that have suicide rates that are three times higher than New Jersey. However, nationally, this still comes out to 130 completions per day, uh, an attempt every 31 seconds, and a completion out of every 25 attempts. The most common uh, method of, of uh, attempting suicide is through firearms and through hanging. And each suicide is estimated to cost $1 million and directly impact 10 people, including six survivors. I don't want to speak cavalierly about that, the impact of suicide, both of a public figure and, of course, in one's own personal and professional life can be devastating. So it's not just so easy as putting a dollar figure on it. And I know some of you know this one firsthand. So breaking the data down into age groups, we can see that suicide is the second leading cause of death for people aged 10 to 34. And then you can see how it decreases as people get older and begin dying of other things. Uh, interesting that the age group that has the highest completion rate, suicide is the 18th leading cause of death. And again, that comes with people dying of other things from ages 64 and up. But second, fourth, and ninth is pretty high through the, you know, through the lifespan. So what this comes out to, and this is some of the older data, is that a significant number of people consider suicide and then of that, a smaller subgroup make a plan and actually attempt. Historically, males have completed suicide more often, about four times as often, despite uh, women attempting more often. And the primary reason for that is due to differences in method. However, uh, women are attempting more through firearms and hanging and less through overdoses. So that difference is um, becoming less. Uh, white people complete suicide more than twice as often as non-white. Divorced, widowed, and single people more than married people. And there are some other additional risk factors that you see here as well. Certain diagnoses such as depression, addiction, schizophrenia, conduct disorder, autism. Actually, the diagnosis that has the highest completion rate of suicide is bipolar disorder, which it may or may not uh, have expected. One in 12 teens has attempted suicide. That's a really high number. You're thinking one out of eight. Um, uh, has actually attempted. So the, the younger you go, the more familiarity people have with this. And the LGBTIQ plus community is at much higher risk, uh, between two and a half and four times higher risk for suicide. And that's probably a topic in a conversation that warrants all of its own attention there, but significantly higher risk, probably for a number of reasons. So going back so we can look at some of the old data and compare. So this is a nice sort of graphic that shows what Americans die of. And this again, this is 2014. So you can see that heart disease in blue and cancer in red are more than half of America's deaths uh, at this point in time. And then you see a bunch of these other things coming in as well. And this is when suicide first broke into the top 10 in 2014, I believe replacing car accidents. 
Now let's take those same numbers and let's move them forward into 2020, which is quite a different ball game since the last, uh, last of these videos was made. Most of these things are somewhat consistent. However, here we are in 2020 with COVID jumping into the number three spot, uh, 350,000 deaths. For the most part, everything else stayed uh, consistent. The numbers changed, but they stayed similar in terms of order. So even though the number of suicides went up from 2014 to 2020, uh, due to the presence of COVID, it dropped to uh, the 11th spot. So just another look at how COVID inserted itself in these uh, death statistics in the United States. It went from non-existent to number three. And as you can see, a pretty comfortable distance in number three between uh, the rest of them um, in 2020. This led to an 18% increase in death. This data also shows the people that died in 2020 were not going to die of other things within that year. Those death rates still went up. So 2020 took out a whole group of people that were not expected to die in that time. In fact, I read somewhere that uh, we had, the Americans had the highest number of deaths since 1943 when we were right in the throes of uh, World War II. So some of the newer stuff that's come out is, uh, I remember when suicide statistics and car accident statistics were pretty similar. Uh, cars have become much safer and suicide has become more of a problem. So it is now six times more death by suicide than car accidents. Uh, the influence on a very controversial issue right now, uh, firearms. So over half of firearm deaths were suicides and a quarter of all suicides are by firearms. So you can see how that, um, you know, how that works as far as a method of, of suicide, but also uh, you know, the gun issue. Uh, another thing that a colleague pointed out to me is that a $1 increase in the real minimum wage was associated with a 2% decrease in the annual state suicide rate. So you talk about work and financial stressors being a contributor to suicide, moving the minimum wage up has shown to have a positive impact on the suicide rate as well. So getting back to, um, getting back to sex here, for females, the highest rates of completion were ages 45 to 64. For men, it was 75 and older. And these are baby boomers who are worried about finances, worried about their health, worried about a lot of things, and also have access to very lethal medications. Um, also, uh, veterans are always at very high risk for suicide, active duty military. We could throw law enforcement in there as well. Those numbers are, are high, getting higher. So the last of some of the new stuff on here is the lowest completion rate was females 10 to 14, but they are also attempting more than ever. And uh, this has been linked to their presence on social media and cyberbullying. Again, that would be a great topic all, all of its own. Maybe we'll take that on in the future. Uh, another thing, if you wanna call this silver lining, is that lots of calls came into suicide hotlines in early 2020. Uh, COVID for all of the devastating impact that it's had uh, both in the United States and worldwide, it did spur a lot of people to get help that weren't getting help previously. Uh, and the other thing that's still being figured out is the impact of COVID and the impact of, the impact of fentanyl on suicide rates. We're gonna talk about fentanyl a little bit more. Uh, COVID we just sort of covered in that it's unclear what impact it had on the suicide rate, but it did bring a whole new group of people into the mortality statistics that wouldn't have been there any other way. So what we have here is some data from early 2022. If you look at the red line, now it's, it's only straight for illustrative purposes, that shows the number of intentional suicides in America during that time. The black line with the dots on it shows uh, drug overdose deaths. Now, when they started out in January 15, those numbers were very close. Since then, the overdose deaths are now double what the suicide rate is. So we worked very hard to address the suicide rate. The suicide rate, although it's increasing, has remained somewhat flat. Um, drug overdoses, and again, this is where fentanyl comes in, uh, those numbers have absolutely skyrocketed. We may actually need to rethink the way that we come at uh, suicide to include more addictions and these sort of these unintentional deaths. And again, I also want to stress there's a real blurry line between those two. Not all suicides are announced and recognized as such. And then many of these overdoses may have in fact been suicides. We just didn't have the evidence to make it so. So there's a blurred line between these two. I think we both agree that we, we both want those numbers going the other way. 
So moving out of the data, let's move into working with someone who is suicidal. And the first thing we need to talk about is that we need to talk about suicide. Um, and we'll, we'll get into some of the myths around that a little later. So regarding suicide, the, the, this list sort of goes from, it goes in increasing order. So the first type of suicidality we want to talk about is death wishes. And, and death wishes are very common when someone has lost someone or someone's going through a difficult time. They might just wish they weren't here anymore, just wish they were, they were dead. And that was the end of it. Uh, very often we've seen this with children. They lose someone and they say, I want to be with grandma. I want to be with so-and-so. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're suicidal. Um, and maybe a, a type of grieving that they're doing. Well, the next thing we want to talk about is hopelessness and anhedonia specifically. Um, when people feel like things aren't going to get better, that motivates people in, in the direction of suicide. If things aren't going to get any better, I want to be out of this pain. And anhedonia is a really interesting word. Uh, it means absence of pleasure. So you think about the activities that bring you the most pleasure. Imagine if you suddenly felt nothing doing those activities. It just didn't make you feel anything at all. Uh, this is a really important risk factor for suicide. If there's someone who loves going fishing and they say, ah, I, just, I just don't really enjoy it anymore. I don't, I don't like doing it. I'm probably going to stop doing it. That's when you start to worry. You know, it's on par with people with giving things away and you know, um, making final plans. So moving on, we'll talk about suicidal thoughts. Again, these are very common. I, I, I would venture to say that most people have suicidal thoughts at one point or another. It's just a thought about suicide. Maybe they use the term fleeting thoughts and that it just comes to mind and then leaves. It doesn't hang around. Now that's to be contrasted with ideations. Ideations is when we start thinking about things a little more seriously. You know, maybe thinking about method or when, or this is when we start to get into details. These thoughts are hanging around and linking up to a certain degree. Now, when we start to get really nervous about um, suicidal ideations is when they start to coalesce into a plan. So this is how I would do it. This is when I was gonna do it. This is the method behind it. All of those things, you know, now they've, they've sort of paved the road ahead of them about what they're going to do. Might not have the, the idea of, okay, here's where I'm gonna do it, here's when I'm gonna do it, but these pieces are starting to come together. And when those pieces come together into a complete plan, then we're just waiting for that triggering incident that's going to bring them to the point of actually trying to kill themselves. One of the other th important pieces to look about is intent. Did the person engage in a behavior that they thought would knowingly kill themselves? There are many people who have made suicide attempts that they did not think would be lethal. Uh, for example, overdosing on Tylenol. People think, well, it's an over-the-counter drug. It's safe. Uh, Tylenol is far more lethal than many prescription uh, drugs. So someone who was overdosed on Tylenol has made a pretty serious decision. Uh, or, and, and then the other way as well, where someone, they may have done a very, they may have done something that they thought was really lethal, and it really wasn't. But the intent is really in the eye of the beholder at that point. The big question to ask is, did you think this was going to kill you? Access is a big issue now. Uh, people have access to far more dangerous medications than they did. You know, Oxycontin and fentanyl are just two uh, two examples, but there are many more, uh, much higher, much purer forms of drugs. Uh, we get back into the firearms discussion here. So people have access. And if you have access, then you've just raised the possibility that something is going to be used. You want to ask about family history and a person's own history. The question that I love to ask is, what's the closest you've ever come to killing yourself? Because that covers the whole continuum. That covers everything from fleeting thoughts and death wishes to well, I made an attempt that I thought was going to succeed, but I, I survived it. So you want to cover that. Also family history. I also keep an eye on when famous people uh, commit suicide. Um, I've been around for the suicides of Kurt Cobain, Robin Williams, and they have a disproportionate impact on people. Sometimes the impact of a celebrity that someone relates to or appreciates uh, can be uh, even a higher impact than when it happens to someone close to them but you're also looking for someone in their peer group as well. You're always looking for a, you know, a chain of suicides to happen once it happens with one person. The last dimension to talk about here is impulsivity during versus planning. Some people are much more likely to hoard up medication, put a detailed plan together and put it into practice. Other people may have a history of just when something happens, they just respond to it right away. And you need to know that about the person you're working with. How likely are they to just all of a sudden decide they're going to do this as opposed to spend a long time thinking about and planning it and putting it together. 
So when someone's suicidal, there's a couple different dimensions in time that you wanna look at. We already mentioned what's the closest you ever came. That's sort of a lifetime thing. But you also want to get idea, an idea how they're doing more recently. Are there any imminent triggers that they're dealing with just in the last couple of days? How have the last couple of weeks been? Does this fit into a cycle that this person's had in their life, you know, where things just go a certain way and then suicide enters the picture kind of as a, almost a predictable symptom you know, in the progression of things? So it's not just how things are going right now. You sort of superimpose right now over recent history and then lifetime. And when all those things line up, that can make that person far more uh, dangerous. One other piece in working with people that are suicidal is, I, I love this equation of suicidal intent. There's always a piece that the person doesn't tell you. And the thing that they don't tell you is probably very important. And usually what that is, is that they've thought of how they're gonna do it. They'll leave out the details. So there's the intent that they tell you. There's the intent that you get being a clinician and having what I call your clinician's gut you know, where you just get that bad feeling. But then there's this other piece as well, and that's what they're not telling you, and that's really significant. So uh, to make a horrible baseball metaphor, Ty does not go to the runner here. If you think someone's dangerous, they're probably more dangerous to themselves than you think they are. You always assume it's a little worse than what you're hearing. A couple other important points about this is that self-mutilation self is not suicidal. That's why we have to be very careful about not saying things like, all right, did you think about hurting yourself, harming yourself, kind of using this soft language. People that are self-mutilating are expressing emotional pain through physical pain. They may have no intention at all of killing themselves. They may actually go until they actually feel pain and that's when they stop. So we have to be very careful about our language here and, and, and divide out self-mutilation from suicidal behavior. Uh, Let's also get rid of this myth. You can't make someone suicidal. I, I hear this still from mental health professionals and people in education, and I can't stand it. It was, it was wrong 30 years ago, and it's wrong now. Talk to people about it. If they've thought about it, they've thought about it. If they haven't thought about it, you're not going to make them think about it. You're not bringing suicide, suicidality into the room. So just come right at them about it like you would any, any other symptom. Another piece is don't keep this to yourself. Uh, even if they say, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, I'll tell you, but you, got, you can't tell anybody, or I want to tell you a secret. Don't play into this. Um, you will work with someone at some point. If you work in the system, you will work with someone who is suicidal, maybe someone who attempts, maybe even someone who completes suicide. What you don't want to do afterwards is be able to look in the mirror and say, you know what, I should have done something. You know, when this happens, you will assess yourself very seriously and what you did and what you could have done. If you come away with, I did everything I was supposed to do. I did everything I could do. I still feel bad that this happened. I feel bad that I couldn't prevent this, but at least you feel like you've done everything. As opposed to there's something else I could have done. You don't want that hanging over your head. Uh, there's also a legal obligation to respond. So there's no harm in telling someone, look, you know, I have to report this. I have a legal obligation. This is my job. This is my career. And my other saying that I love is, I would rather you be alive and pissed off at me than dead. Um, consult your supervisor, consult your colleagues. Half the time, if you have a judgment call, by the time you're done explaining the judgment call to your supervisor or to your peer, you already know what you need to do. Sometimes you just need to hear yourself say it. And as we mentioned before, direct language. I, I was bad at this for many, many years. I didn't want to just say it. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Just put it out there. It's like any other question. Uh, it's important to know and don't blur it by changing the language and making the language in it soft. So when do we talk about uh, suicide? At intake, at first contact. Uh, I like asking that question, what's the closest you ever come? I've also hedged by saying, you know, I have to ask this. I have to ask everybody about suicide. So I'm going to ask you. There are plenty of ways to go about doing this. So get it out of the way, start right at the beginning, start the discussion about it, especially when that person isn't in crisis. You don't want to start the discussion about suicide when that person's in crisis already. And again, I also want to balance this out by talking about goals and what they want. I like the hope for the best, plan for the best, but expect the worst. You know, you're prepared either way. 
So talk about goals and what that person wants and why that person's living in the first place. You know, what is it that brings them joy and meaning in their life? That will help you when you have to have a discussion about suicide. So there are many tools for assessing suicide uh, for adults and for children. And this is the one that I actually like best, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Uh, I have the information for this at the end of the presentation, so you can go right to it or you can search this and find it. I like a bunch of things about this, and I've seen agencies that have taken this little questionnaire and just popped it right into their paperwork. So think about what we just talked about with the death wishes and the intent, and the ideation and all that stuff. And then take a look at this questionnaire and see how it works. Have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Have you actually had any thoughts about killing yourself? And if they say no, then you move on to question six. Have you done anything, started to do anything or prepared to do anything to end your life? If they've said yes, now you do three, four, and five as well. Have you thought about how you might do this? Have you any intention of acting on these thoughts? So you hear the details, the intent, the plan, and all these are built in. And the responses here are color-coded. So the yellow is low risk, the orange medium risk, the red is high risk, and your agency or you can already have your plan for what do you do when somebody hits each of these you know, color brackets you know, the orange or the red, what are you going to do? What's going to be the response? You don't want to under respond, you don't want to over respond. So, and you see some of the information here uh, as well about it. There are different versions of the Columbia suicide scale for healthcare providers, for schools, for families and friends. Uh, the website is here and it's also in the, uh, the resources. Their training is free. Uh, they, uh, they ask for your data because they're constantly trying to validate and improve it. So. Uh, there are other ways to go, but I would definitely start here, especially if you're looking for something for you, your practice, or your agency. I would go right there, certainly research that a little more. So just to wrap up, we've talked about suicide entered the top 10 causes of death in the United States, and it has since uh, declined out of the top 10. Uh, I am sad to say that I'm expecting it's going to be back. The suicide rate has been steadily increasing for about 20 years. We're in a bit of a uh, tail away now because of COVID and because of fentanyl and because of some other things. Uh, but again, I expect that to be temporary. There are certain populations that are at higher risk, people in rural areas, white adults over 55, certain marital statuses, and again, the LGBT um, people as well. There are different levels of suicidality, and it's really important to differentiate between them. One, we can't have no discussion about suicide. And two, we just can't assume that everyone who mentions the word you know, is suicidal and needs to be institutionalized or whatever. We have to be able to have an honest discussion to find out where that person is on the continuum of suicidality. Talking about suicide is critical, but starting at day one, but all the way through, it's always something we should be uh, checking in on. Uh, people will withhold data about being suicidal. The stigma around it, the shame around it is so high. And of course, if this person wants to commit suicide, telling you about it is not a way uh, to help that but also them telling you about it also shows their ambivalence. Uh, to my experience, most people that are suicidal do not wanna be dead. They do not wanna kill themselves. They want the pain to end. They want the difficulty to end and they don't see any other way. And maybe it's your job to work with them and help them maintain that hope and help them you know, find that other way. Always better to talk to someone about it than find out otherwise later. No secrets, talk about this with someone. If you feel compelled to keep something to yourself, it's probably something that shouldn't be. So um, the resources we looked at, a lot of the data came from the American Association of Suicidology. They have a fantastic website. Here's the information for the Lighthouse. Um, there's also a great training called Mental Health First Aid. And they refer to it as CPR for suicide. There's a youth version as well. See a couple of the crisis hotlines and all that good stuff. Here are some resources for uh, youth and also NAMI's information, the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Uh, they have a lot of great resources, great web website as well. And my closing thought for this is, if you are someone that has had thoughts about suicide, or contemplating suicide, uh, this is the earth and it's a better place because you're in it. So I would pass this message along to the people you're working with as well, that they have a place here, they have a purpose here, there are people that care about them here and want them here. The suicide is something that negatively impacts all of us. So here's the other information, other things that uh, I got uh, information from this presentation for. 
So with that, I will end. So you have a wonderful rest of your day and look forward to talking to you again. Please check out the rest of our videos. Um, and I'll see you soon.